Thanks for tuning into this week's Stacker Chat. Stacks is smart contracts for Bitcoin, and I'm joined by Mani Bali, Stacks founder, for your weekly updates. So can we start by briefly covering the Stacks thesis as we're going to dive a little bit deeper into Stacks' connection to Bitcoin again this week? Yeah, absolutely. So I think I think the Stacks thesis really stems from the Bitcoin thesis, right? So you cannot really understand the Stacks thesis without, without understanding Bitcoin. And with Bitcoin, I think the, the thing to know about is that it is the most decentralized, the most secure blockchain out there that is basically trying to do just one thing. It is trying to give the world a sound money, a hard money that cannot be changed, where the rules are fair for everybody. And that's, that's, an, that's an extremely important thing uh, for, for, for society. So I think if the, if the world is getting a completely new type of, uh, of currency, of a reserve asset, uh, it's, that's where I think people start thinking about what can you build on top? Like what type of financial markets would be unlocked by Bitcoin? What type of different applications can be built on Bitcoin? Right? So that's basically the step one where we know that Bitcoin already has a trillion dollars of capital. This might be like 5 trillion, 10 trillion or more in the future if Bitcoin basically keeps doing what it is doing and it keeps getting more and more adoption. So the first question becomes that can we make Bitcoin productive? Can we actually deploy Bitcoin into smart contracts, into applications, into other automated ways where people can, can start making money on their Bitcoin. Because a lot of Bitcoiners, they don't, they don't actually want to sell Bitcoin. I would much rather lend out my Bitcoin in a trustless manner and earn yield on it or, or, or have my Bitcoin as collateral to get a stablecoin loan instead of actually selling my Bitcoin, right? So I think that's kind of like step one where you make Bitcoin capital productive. And step two is that once kind of like Bitcoin is fully established as the global settlement layer, there are many different types of applications that can actually benefit by settling information on Bitcoin. So you're not changing Bitcoin, you're not kind of like you know, putting needless data into Bitcoin, but you're actually just like building applications that can settle on Bitcoin. These could be things like decentralized names, you've seen the dot BDC domains, uh, out there. These could be uh, Twitter handle like decentralized versions of that. There could be other information uh, where you're just settling the data on the Bitcoin chain. And Bitcoin as a settlement layer, Bitcoin as a application platform uh, could really power the next generation decentralized internet economy, which sometimes people call Web3. I know sometimes there could be a uh, somewhat of a perceived clash between the Web3 communities and Bitcoin. In, in my view, like a lot of the applications that are actually valuable, that, that end up having a product market fit and actually being useful to a lot of users, they would just end up getting built, built on top of Bitcoin. And I think that's, that's the Stacks thesis. And Stacks is the technology, it's a programming layer that is enabling these types of applications to be, to be built in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Great, thank you. And can you talk about sort of the different ways that new features for Bitcoin can be enabled that led to Stacks design? Yeah, so I think there's a, there's a very uh, rich history of people trying to do other types of things on, on top of Bitcoin, right? So even, even back in the day, uh, I think all the way back to like 2011, uh, the Namecoin project with Satoshi himself kind of like, you know, uh, at least contributed ideas to, we don't know if he contributed code or not, but at least contributed ideas to that project and was very supportive of it, was basically trying to have additional use cases, in this case, decentralized domains, uh, reusing Bitcoin's hash power, right? And there have been ideas like, uh, you know, master coin or colored coins. There, there was counterparty, which still operates in one, one shape or form uh, that introduced the idea of NFTs uh, on, on top of Bitcoin. So the early versions, people were literally putting all of the data needed for their application or their new protocol, literally in the Bitcoin blockchain itself. Right? So the way counterparty works is that all the data is written in the Bitcoin chain. And we have some experience with it, like especially the Stacks team members. We worked on a technology called virtual chain and at one point, it was the largest uh, consumer of op return data in, in Bitcoin, right? So it was, it was one of the largest protocols on top of Bitcoin. And where we learned a, a bunch of lessons that these approaches don't scale that well. So 
from a smart contract perspective, like uh, you don't get fully expressive smart contracts, but more importantly, you're not gonna pay like, you know, 30 bucks in transaction fees to record like some small amount of data on the Bitcoin blockchain. And where, whereas the Bitcoin block space is very, very valuable. And I think a lot of work goes into keeping that blockchain very small. So it's very decentralized. Anyone can have a, have a copy of it. So a lot of, I would say since 2017, uh, developers basically have stopped trying to build more on-chain protocols. And a lot of focus has been off-chain, like Lightning is off-chain, right? Like uh, it, it, it is separate from Bitcoin. It only does settlement transactions on the Bitcoin uh, main chain. So I would classify the era between, let's call it roughly 2014 to 2017, when there was a lot of innovation, people were trying to build interesting things using on-chain data on literally on the Bitcoin blockchain itself. And I think since 2017, uh, like people have realized that that doesn't really scale. And most of the solutions these days, uh, they don't even attempt to put a lot of data on, on the Bitcoin blockchain itself. All right, thank you. And so what are the different kinds of Bitcoin layers and sort of what distinguishes them uh, in their feature sets? I think that's a, that's a very interesting question because I do think that a lot of a lot of the people, like even in the Bitcoin community, uh, these are very technical topics. And I don't think people can easily compare and contrast what these different layer, layers are like. So I've been writing a blog post, uh, which, which I'll share in the coming weeks. But the framework that I'm taking is that I first try to classify these solutions uh, into, is this like an on-chain protocol? Meaning that is all of the data being written on the Bitcoin chain? Or not. So there's a category of solutions, as I said, uh, you know, it's mostly mostly for historical reasons, like people don't do this anymore, like since, since 2017. And then there are these solutions where there's some sort of a uh, data outside of Bitcoin or some sort of a layer outside of Bitcoin. And there are really two categories there. One category um, does not have a global ledger, right? So Lightning will fall into that category. So Lightning doesn't have a global ledger. Uh, it's more of a peer-to-peer -peer system. People set up these channels, they make the make the lightning payments and then they close those channels. Right? There's no global ledger like Bitcoin uh, for, for lightning. And same for DLCs. If you're not familiar with them, they're, they basically try to do somewhat more complicated uh, smart contracts like transactions. But again, uh, you don't have a global ledger. And, and uh, so, so I would categorize DLCs similar to lightning. Uh, where you don't get a global ledger. And then there are some solutions where uh, they're targeting the type of applications that actually require global ledgers. And that there, there's a large uh, number of applications that do require a global ledger. I think the top app, uh, examples would be any, any automated market makers like uh, Uniswap, any, uh, any application where you're trying to build up a liquidity pool uh, or uh, even decentralized names, right? Like you, you need a global ledger to record the history of who owns the name and how to how to resolve it. NFT marketplaces, like you can't list your NFT for sale without having some sort of a global information where where how you're listing the asset and, and so on. So so these are the examples. And if you if you notice a trend, these are the type of things that are taking off in the crypto industry in general, right? And and most of the modern smart contract platforms, including kind of like Ethereum, which is a little bit older, but the newer L1s like Solana, Avalanche, Algorand, Near, you name it, every single smart contract platform, like almost like by default, like would have a global ledger because the global ledger is really needed uh, to enable, enable these applications. So, it, so coming back to the Bitcoin ecosystem, uh, the solutions that do have a global ledger uh, would be Liquid, which is a federated network, uh, or RSK, which is a merged mine network, or Stacks, which uh, uses open mining. So any, anyone can be a, be a miner on, on the Stacks network. But those are kind of like the three main projects uh, that do have a global ledger. And, and, and so Liquid, interestingly, uh, they, they are doing some work on a kind of like a more expressive smart contract language, but that is not live on Liquid yet. Liquid, Liquid has uh, some new opcodes that uh, are not present in Bitcoin, but are present on Liquid. So people can actually issue like new types of tokens on Liquid. Like that's kind of like the main application you can you can build, but it's a federation, right? So, and we can get into like, what's the difference between a federation, 
a merged mind network or, or, or in an open network. Thank you. On that note, um, is it possible to maintain a global ledger without a new token? And can you elaborate on um, the categories you just mentioned? Yeah, so that, that's the uh, million dollar question, or I should say the billion dollar question, right? Like uh, the amount of people, especially in the Bitcoin community, because they uh, they they get their information sources from 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 the type of places that are typically very anti new tokens. So I think generally it's a good thing to ask the question: that is the token really needed for this protocol or this application? But I think there is this confusion that you can maintain a global ledger uh, without a token, right? You can make trade-offs, and I think it's good to understand what those trade-offs are. Uh, so one example would be that you run a federated network. So liquid is the prime example, right? So over there, what you're trading off is like, you know, a normal person can't just become a miner there. You have to be part of the select group of people who are, you know, however they pick the, the, the federation nodes and, and that's, that's how liquid works, right? So you're actually sacrificing decentralization. You're relying on more centralized parties uh, and in, in an attempt to remove the token, but it, it actually goes like even deeper than that because these tokens are often used as incentives for people to mine the network, right? Uh, even if you look at Bitcoin, Bitcoin has been in production for over a decade. Even today, the main incentive that why miners actually mine the Bitcoin network is because of the Coinbase rewards, the newly minted Bitcoin that are coming out. The transaction fees on Bitcoin are a very, very small percent of the total uh, kind of like rewards available to miners. And this is actually uh, a, a potential criticism of Bitcoin that what's going to happen in the future when the Coinbase rewards keep going down and the transaction fees aren't big enough. I, I believe that transaction fees will be big enough. If anything, you know, Stacks actually helps with that. It brings more incentives uh, for higher transaction fees on, uh, for Bitcoin miners. So I think that's the key question that especially in the early days of a network, let's call it the first five years, 10 years or something like that, you're likely not going to have enough uh, gas fees, enough transaction fees to justify miners to come in and actually operate the network. And, and I was collecting some data recently, and I think it's still in the process of like getting it, but at least uh, some people have pointed out that RSK, for example, has roughly $200,000 worth of incentives uh, in terms of gas fees for miners. If you think about it, uh, even if there are like five miners on the network, that's like less than fifty thousand dollars a month, right? Uh, like, like that's that's that that that's not a lot of money at all uh, for securing a smart contract platform that can potentially, uh, you know, be powering like uh, like billions of dollars of transactions. And these these modern smart contract platforms do have billions of dollars of incentives uh, on a on a on a monthly or yearly basis. Uh, where miners can come in and they have an incentive to actually operate the network. They have an incentive where people are paying them gas fees and they can actually execute those, those, uh, the, those transactions and, and those smart contracts. Stacks is relatively early, but even the first year, it had close to $100 million in, in mining incentives. And I think that number effectively grows with more usage of the network, with, with obviously uh, you know, the price factors, into this as well. But in general, the way to think about this is that there is a clear path to reaching escape velocity because you get both the Coinbase rewards and the transaction fees for the miners. Liquid and RSK, they don't have Coinbase rewards. So I think in their effort, and I, I applaud the effort, right? like they're trying to be uh, kind of like in some ways uh, true to the vision of Bitcoin and be like, hey, we will actually have no other assets. But then in the end, you end up designing a system that's like very complicated and doesn't have the right incentives in place for, for all sorts of different parties to come in. So I think that's the trade-off. And the uh, when, when people ask us that, hey, why don't you do something like merge mining? My first answer is because RSK is already exploring that, right? Like, and I think they're doing a great job. I personally don't believe in merge mining. I've seen a lot of problems with Namecoin. I'm seeing those problems uh, occur again on, on, on the RSK side. For example, I think uh, there currently, I believe something like 45% of Bitcoin 
hash power is merge mining with RSK for very little incentives. Remember, like, I think I think a bunch of these people are just doing it because they want to support the project, not because there's money money to be made there. And and what happens is that if a large Bitcoin miner, let's say somebody with 20, 25% of Bitcoin hash power starts to merge mine, you by default have more than 50% of hash, hash power on the smaller network, right? And that's a fundamental problem we saw with Namecoin. And, and so merge mining in my mind has question marks. So I would much rather explore some new direction, uh, especially a direction that has more proven record of being successful. There are so many smart contract platforms out there uh, it's a tried and tested way where you have both Coinbase rewards and gas fees. And at some point, the gas fees become significant enough, which happened in the case of Ethereum. I think Ethereum has significant uh, gas fee re revenues for the miners. And I think Stacks is basically uh, taking that approach that is much more well tested from a incentives perspective in, in, in the real world.